This is Promise Christian University Soul Care. It's introduction to inner healing and deliverance. This is week three of our sessions. So I'm going to open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Father, your word says to pray for the laborers, for the harvest field is ripe. Father, that you are going deep in each and every one of us. You're restoring our very soul, for you're a lover of our soul, and we're your bride. You're raising your bride up to be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And through these classes, Father, you're doing that. And not only are you healing us and cleansing us, but you're preparing us, Father, to go out into the dark world as Isaiah 60 says, to arise and shine, for your light has come. For darkness is covering the whole earth, and deep darkness is covering your people, Father. But your bride will arise and shine, for your glory has come upon her, Father. So we thank you that you're teaching us, you're training us, you're equipping us for the work of ministry. In Yeshua's holy name, amen and amen. The scripture that the Lord gave me for tonight's teaching is Psalms 139. So if you have your Bible with you, I want you to turn it to Psalms 139. Psalms 139, starting at verse 1. Jehovah, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down. In my rising up, you understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Jehovah, you know it all together. You have hedged me in behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning, and dwell in the utmost parts of the sea. Even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will please you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eye saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they are all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O oh Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who raise up against you? I hate them with the perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O oh God. And know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me 
and lead me in the way everlasting. Your heavenly Father chose you. He picked that egg and that sperm to come together on purpose. Whether your parents planned it or not, from conception, God knew who you were going to be. All of your days were already written. And some of you, as we heard stories tonight, some of those days were extremely painful and devastating. And some not so bad. But what I've learned, especially in my own life, all the hell that I've been through, all that hell that I went through, that rejection, that abandonment, that hurt, that pain, God has healed it. And now he's turning it around for his glory. So what the enemy has meant to destroy me with, the very thing at times when you read in the book, I wanted to kill myself. I really wanted to die. I didn't call somebody and go, you know, hey, I'm going to kill myself. Come and rescue me. I didn't want anybody to know I really wanted to die. And so I see that the enemy was there wounding me. But I also know that the Father had greater plans for my life and that he had plans to heal me and restore me. He had plans for me to minister to the whole bride of Christ. But it took me falling on my face as a young girl and crying out and asking him what was wrong with my life. Why was I such a mess? Because until we ask those questions, sometimes we don't get answers. Does that make sense? So often the word of, well, the word of God says that Yeshua suffered to comfort us, that we might turn around and comfort others in their suffering. And so when we press in, the word says to count it all joy when you're going through trials and tribulations. Now, when we're going through trials and tribulations, it doesn't feel like it's joy. And I remember looking back on my life when the Lord gave me that scripture, it was all hell was breaking loose. It was the worst of the worst of the worst of the worst of the worst times in my life. And I really, really thought that God was just playing a a bad joke in putting in Scripture to count it all joy. But what I found is that the word that he's working out a perfectness and a completeness in us, he's using that hell to bring us to him. Have you guys, what are you doing here on a Tuesday night? Why have you guys called my office? Why have you come? Because he's using the hurt and pain where our life is falling apart for the very thing to be that safety net to catch us. Is that not true? And that he has greater things past this hurt and pain. He used to show me when it was the worst of the worst of the worst of my life, that I was in a dark tunnel. And he said, you're going to get to the light. And once you get to the light, you're going to find the way out of this dark tunnel. And then you're going to go back and you're going to grab the people that's in this dark tunnel and you're going to bring them to the light. You're going to show them the way. Now, that didn't make sense to me when my life was falling apart and I was absolutely miserable. But I can see the wisdom and the knowledge of what he taught me through the trials and tribulations. So if you're going through a trial and a tribulation right now, if things are not that wonderful in your life, you're really being set up. You're being set up to learn things that you could have not learned any other way, and you're sitting and you're paying attention. Because one of the things that I learned in the hardship, was when my heart was heavy, I paid closer attention. I would spend more time in the presence of God. I would grab the Bible and I'd say, you better give me something today, because if you don't give me something today, I'm not making it till tomorrow. 
I need something from you now. And he would give me scripture that brought me life. He would give me scripture that I memorized forever. Because my heart was heavy at that moment, I was able to learn what he was trying to give me. And I held on because it meant something. Has God given you a scripture in the hardest time of your life? Have you run to prayer when things get hard? Do you run to him when things get hard? When things aren't working anymore? When things don't work the way you think they should work and you made your own path and you've done it your way and now things are falling apart and we've got to come back and say, how do you want me to do it? But because you're the bride of Christ, it's not just for you. You know, I see many Christians that's been Christians for many, many years, and they're not bearing fruit. It's all about me. My eyes are still downward and inward. I'm still being yanked around by all the demons. I'm still doing the same old, same old, and I'm not going forward in my Christian walk. I'm not doing anything for the kingdom. I'm still stuck. I'm still at this place where I need to move forward or do something because the fruit of my life, it's not being produced for the kingdom of God. And we can be Christians forever and never produce anything for the kingdom of God. Because as long as our eyes are inward and downward and we're hurting and we're wounded, we look inward and it's about self. We become very selfish people. It's all about my wounds. It's all about how bad I feel. Let me talk about me. Let me work on me. Listen to me. And and, and I'm not putting any of you down because that's what I'm here for. (laughs) But listen to the fact that how long have you been a Christian and now God wants us to grow up. He says to count it all joy when you go through trials and tribulations because he is perfecting you. He's maturing you. He's stretching you. How many of you have ever had a shot for the very first time? Anybody ever have a shot for, like when you were a kid? Were you scared to death and it really hurt when you had your first shot? So if you've ever had major surgery after that first shot, that first shot seems like nothing. It, it's like no big deal. And if you've gone through a lot of medical procedures where you had lots and lots of shots or lots of things, that first shot was like, no, here, take my blood. Get it over with. It's no big deal. That's kind of what happens with us is pretty soon we get past the immaturity and we grow up and it's about the body of Christ. All of your days were written There are people on the other side of your testimony waiting for you. There's marriages that need to be healed. There's single women that are single mothers that need to be ministered to. There's men that's stuck in pornography that that need to be delivered. There's so many people crying on the other side of your freedom. God doesn't want you to stay stuck. What happens when we're broken? Our eyes are inward and downward. But when we get healed, our eyes go from inward and downward to upward and outward. Pretty soon, it's about him and his kingdom. It's no longer about self. It's about furthering the kingdom of God. In um, the book... Charles Kraft talked about his appendix where it became infected and really bad. It's important that we get rid of pus pockets because those pus pockets, the enemy knows right where to go, right where to hit, right where to hit us. And and that's why asking the Lord to reveal those pus pockets and heal them 
So we're not being yanked around by the same demons over and over. When you read the book, The Bride of Christ, it talks about when I was pregnant and I went to get grapes. And Reverend Ben asked me what I was eating and it was a big deal for me. And I cried. I was mad. I was going to move out that day. Now I'm very pregnant. And I waddled myself up the stairs and I'm moving out. That's it. I'm never taking another penny of his money, and I'm going to work the next day. I'm bedridden. I'm at the end of this pregnancy that's a very hard pregnancy, and I gained a lot of weight, but I'm going to work the next day. I'm never taking another penny. And I asked the Lord, what is going on? And he showed me one little thing in my past that I thought I was completely healed of everything in my past. It had been like 10 years he was healing me. And all of a sudden, he showed me my mother standing over us little kids because my parents were alcoholics. There was no money. There was no food. We would have to move two or three times a year because they wouldn't pay rent. And us little kids were huddled together with a bag of potato chips, and it must have been I don't know where we got it, but we're eating it like crazy. And my mother's yelling, you pigs, you eat everything in this house. And, you know, my husband didn't say those exact words. But in a way he said, now, his love language is acts of service. So when I didn't offer him grapes, he felt rejected. So now I know a lot more about relationships, okay? But in those days, I didn't. And I asked the Lord, where this pain, this anger, it was volcanic. I mean, I was so angry that I was spitting fire. And the Lord showed me this one scene that I hadn't remembered. So many things we don't remember. And we think we're healed. We think we're gone past it. And many things he's healed. Now, for some of us, it's more things than others. For me, it was that incident that had to do with food. God had already dealt with molestation. He had already dealt with a lot of other things, but he had never dealt with the food issue. And any time anybody would call somebody a pig for eating, have you ever heard somebody say, oh, they're just pigs, look at them eat? I would want to jump out of my skin. If somebody said something about my kids eating food, I would say, they could eat whatever they want. I'll buy more food. Leave them alone. They're fine. And, and I would want people to eat when they would come to my house. And, but I never put the two and two together. Has that ever happened to any of you? We, so the pus pocket got touched. And the Lord allowed that to happen with my husband because he wanted that to be healed. Amen? I cried for 45 minutes when the memory came up. I didn't remember the emotions. I could not remember the emotions. I just saw the scene, and I cried hard for about 45 minutes. And then I was mad at God. It's like, what? Something else? You mean I've got to be healed in another area? Why didn't you do it all at once? You know what he told me? You couldn't handle it all at once. That you cried for 45 minutes over this one little thing. How could I have healed you for ten, the 10 years I've been taking you through healing a little bit at a time? And he's so good at one little layer at a time. But if you have a lot of emotions that come up, you get depressed or you get really angry or something emotionally is really going on. Sometimes there's a pus pocket behind it. So stop and ask the Lord, where is this pus pocket coming from? Where, where is this hurt? Where is this anger? I didn't even know it was hurt. I just asked, where is this anger coming from? I love my husband. But I was so ready to run. To run because I was a runner. I would check out. I would run. But you know what happened when I ran? 
you guys probably heard me say this a hundred times. I came with me. <laughs> and I was still going through all this stuff. <laughs> so you can't run from yourself. What is going on in that relationship? Why are you having all these emotions? We many times overreact in situations. You know, military men that come back from war, they have post-traumatic stress. Now, post-traumatic stress means you had something that hurt you or you went through a real trauma, and now you're, it's after that trauma and you're, having, you're going through a stressful time without even knowing that you're reacting to that trauma. I remember um, I had gotten in a really horrible car accident after Reverend Ben and I got together, and my car was completely destroyed, completely demolished on the 60 freeway. I, um, I was at a dead stop, and the guy behind me didn't even break, and I was in the fast lane. I was laid up for at least two years with back injury. And my wonderful Boaz took care of me <laughs> and our children. But every time I got in a car and I thought somebody was going to hit me, I would like, oh! And Reverend Ben would go, knock it off. But, you know, I didn't realize I was reacting to what had happened to me earlier. And, and it took me a long time to get over the fact of that really bad accident. Has that ever happened to any of you? So that's a post-traumatic stress. Our men in military come back from war, and they have post-traumatic post stress. Some of our homes was a war zone. Some of our homes were literally a war zone. And we have post-traumatic stress from our childhood. And we don't even know it. Because we survived. How many of you survived? You're good survivors. I used to pride myself on surviving. You know, I got through. I made it through. You're here. You survived. But what do you do with all that pain? You bury it. So when you're ministering, you have to remember that people bury that to survive, but a lot of people have post-traumatic stress. And depending on your temperament and even the temperaments of your parents, that um, the, and we're going to talk about temperaments, the last uh, module of, of inner healing, of soul care. But the a melancholy temperament is very sensitive and they get their feelings hurt really easy. So the choleric temperament, the strong-willed temperament that puts a lot of pressure on that melancholy temperament brings a lot of intimidation, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. So even though the choleric parent might be a great parent and do everything in order, they can still really hurt their child and thinking that their child shouldn't be hurt. Because, after all, they should have just cleaned their room. They should just pick up their bike. What's wrong with you? And so even words can be cutting to the temperament. Does that make sense to anybody? We can feel rejected and abandoned. Rejection and abandonment is strong demons. They can enter in the womb. They can enter at conception. If our parents had a spirit of rejection and abandonment, that demon can be a bloodline. It just follows the bloodline. And the minute you're conceived, that, de that demon can be on you. What does rejection and aban abandonment do? It puts walls around your heart. It keeps love from coming in and love from going out. Even when people are loving you. I think somebody talked about a stepfather and you had rejection, so you didn't let the stepfather love you. You rejected that. I've heard many times uh, people that's been adopted where because of the spirit of rejection and abandonment there, 
they would push back. I think somebody was in my office just recently that, that pushed back and couldn't allow that love to come in because of that spirit of rejection and abandonment. Self-rejection, self-hatred will go along with rejection and abandonment. Have you ever been around somebody that you couldn't stand? You, like, wanted to get rid of them really quick? They bugged the heck out of you? Sometimes they have a spirit of rejection and abandonment, and they act up to push you away. And especially if you have the anointing on your life. I remember um, my sister, my sister that was two years older than I am, she is my father's stepdaughter. I'm, my, I'm the only child of my father, biological child. And he abused her horribly because she was only two. And I remember as an adult, I couldn't stand talking to her. And when I went back to Texas for a, a funeral or my grandmother was sick or something, this woman was an alcoholic, and every word out of her mouth was argumentative. And I remember going into my hotel room and just kind of shaking my head going, I don't want to even deal with this woman. She is just so hard. And the next morning when I got up, I started praying going, God, I can't stand this woman. And the Lord said to me, you haven't even talked to her yet. You haven't even talked to her yet. She's in this long, dark tunnel cave. And she's way in the back. And her prison guards have been coming out talking to you. And then, because being in a hotel room, have you ever had those dark curtains? The, I love sleeping in hotel rooms with those dark curtains. Well, it was so dark in the morning, I went to the bathroom and I turned on the light but I just cracked the door so I could barely have a little bit of light to get my eyes used to it. Have you guys ever? I just couldn't stand the bright light right away. The Lord used that as an illustration. He said, she's in the back of this cave in such darkness, and when she sees the light in you, it blinds her. And that you haven't even talked to her yet. And so he, at that point, told, I was in between um, some conferences and I had to go back to Amarillo, Texas for um, my mother or my grandmother, some illness. And the Lord said to me, take your favorite ring and put it on her finger. And tell her how much that ring means to you. But tell her she means more to you. Tell her how much you love her. Do you know that melted her? And when she died a couple of years later of leukemia, her husband took it off her finger and gave it to me to give to my daughter. And he said, you don't know what that ring did to her. Because, you know, when people have rejection and abandonment, they, they put walls around their heart. And they keep people away. And it's self-rejection. And you know what demons do? Is they tell the other person what you did wrong. They never tell the person what they did wrong. The demon only shows you, the host of that demon, what the other people are doing to reject you. They're never showing you your action or the words you said to get them to reject you. They're only saying, see, see, nobody loves you. See, they're leaving you. See, they're going to leave you just like everybody else. They don't love you. Look how they talk to you. Look how mean they were to you. But these demons never show the post person how they're treating other people. My second husband was never available. through. He never entered into the marriage. Never. And I remember I would say, I love you. And he would say, you're going to leave me like everybody else. You're going to stab me in the back just like everybody else. 
So through the whole marriage, he never entered in. He was never part of that marriage, literally. And I remember one day praying, and I said, Lord, what is it? And the Lord said to me, it's a spirit of rejection and abandonment. Now, I didn't know to the degree I know today what a spirit of rejection and abandonment is. But to this day, this man has just gotten worse than better. But he created situations where people would leave him. And then the demons would say, see, they all just stab you in the back. They all leave you. But the demons never showed him what he did to get people to leave him. Does that make sense? So it's true. When you're ministering, remember rejection and abandonment is very big. And it builds walls around a person's heart. And it keeps love from coming in and love from going out. There's feelings of worthlessness and inadequacy that comes along with hurt and pain. There's shame and guilt. God promises to give double honor for shame. You, I lay it all out. I'm like Pastor Nicole. Everything comes out. <laughs> That's the only way I know how to teach you because that's how God taught me. But there was such shame on my life because of not only the sin that was committed against me with molestation, but the sins that I committed. And I was guilty and I felt horrible and I felt dirty. But do you know the blood of Yeshua cleanses it all. And he gives double honor for shame. God brings conviction, not condemnation. There's a difference. Conviction is like his thumbs on you. And he's like, you need to go and apologize. You need to quit gossiping. You need to do this. You need to quit sinning. You need this. And he's pointing things out that you need change. Have you guys ever felt that conviction? The enemy brings guilt and condemnation. And he beats you up with it. Anytime you start feeling really heavy guilt or, or real condemnation, that you're so bad, that's the enemy putting that on you or on the person you're ministering to. It can bring, hurts and pains can bring anger, resentment, a root of bitterness, fear, anxiety, worry, intimidation. Rebellion, confusion, insecurity, desire to escape. So these are the demons that can latch on to the hurt and the pain of your client. Your client needs to be willing to work on healing. When I first started ministering, it's so important that the Holy Spirit heals you first, but then he starts bringing people to you to pray for. But they have to be willing to go and walk through the garbage and to bring it up because this is painful stuff. This is hard. Some sessions people go home in exhaustion. It takes hours to recover from the exhaustion <laughs> weeks. <laughs> It, it's highly unlikely to impossible for people to be healed if they are not willing to work on their own healing. They really need, you are just a vessel of the Holy Spirit. So you can offer healing prayer, but ultimately this is the person's own battle. It says to work out your own salvation. Well, salvation is all-inclusive, and you have to be willing to be sanctified. I'm going to jump down real quick since I used the word sanctified. Because the Lord gave me six words. Salvation, justification, restoration, sanctification, and transformation. So the first word, salvation... The first time that word was mentioned in your Bible was when Moses was taking the children of Israel out of Egypt. And the children of Israel were standing before the Red Sea and the army behind them. 
And the Lord said to Moses to tell the people, stand still, stand firm, fear not, and see the salvation of the Lord. That word salvation is actually Yeshua. Isn't that awesome? And that word salvation is all-inclusive. It's deliverance, it's healing, it's restoration. It's bringing us to a place of atonement for our sins and to bring us into justification. Justification is what Yeshua did at Calvary for us sinners. Before we even knew him, while we were still sinners, he died for us. And his blood justifies us our sin, but we cannot treat that spirit of grace as if it were a common thing. We can't trample justification under our feet and say, I can live however I want. I can be in drugs. I can be in sexual sin. I can do whatever I want because I'm justified. That's what's being taught today, and that is God wants us to go from salvation and justification to restoration. Isaiah 61, he's come to bind up the broken heart and set the captives free. We're not the bride of Christ if we're not restored. If we're broken, we've got bitterness and resentment and rejection and abandonment and anger and rage and hatred and all that stuff going through us. Plus, we're sinning because we're trying to get comfortable in all this stuff. So God wants to restore our emotions. He's come to bind up the broken heart to set the captives free. Then he takes us to sanctification. Sanctification is setting us apart for holiness, for righteousness, to glorify his great name. To He's holy. It says to be holy as he's holy. So he sanctifies us. And through this process, he transforms us into his image. Pretty soon, we start acting and talking and believing. And we want to be like him. This is such a perfect time that we're in right now, the the month of Elul. We're coming up tomorrow night to Rosh Hashanah. It's the new year, uh, the Jewish new year. And it starts the 10 days of awe, uh, of returning and cleansing and forgiving people and having them forgive you and getting healed and restored for the Day of Atonement. Coming up on the 30th, we'll be preaching on that on the 30th, and we'll be having a little thing tomorrow night. But what a perfect time to be in. But he wants to restore us. He wants to sanctify us. He wants to transform us. So it's salvation, justification, restoration, sanctification, transformation to bring glorification to his name. Because we're not glorifying him if we just stay in salvation. We're not glorifying him if we just stay in justification. He wants us to move on into restoration, sanctification, and transformation. And that's what soul care and inner healing and deliverance is all about. Let's give him a clap offering. I'm going to close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Oh, that you're washing us with water by your word. That you're presenting us to be glorious without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That, Father, you're coming back for your bride. Not a crippled bride, not a broken bride, not a dirty bride, but a glorious bride. And you're restoring our soul because you're the lover of our soul. You're cleansing those things out of us, Father. And then you're raising us up to be those laborers for the harvest field because the harvest field is ripe. All for your glory and all for your kingdom. In Yeshua's name, amen and amen. So these are the demons that can latch on to the hurt and the pain of your client. 
Your client needs to be willing to work on healing. When I first started ministering, it's so important that the Holy Spirit heals you first, but then he starts bringing people to you to pray for. But they have to be willing to go and walk through the garbage and to bring it up because this is painful stuff. This is hard. Some sessions, people go home in exhaustion. It takes hours to recover from the exhaustion. <laughs> Weeks. <laughs> It, it's highly unlikely to impossible for people to be healed if they are not willing to work on their own healing. They really need, you are just a vessel of the Holy Spirit. So you can offer healing prayer, but ultimately this is the person's own battle. It says to work out your own salvation. Well, salvation is all-inclusive, and you have to be willing to be sanctified. I'm going to jump down real quick since I used the word sanctified. Because the Lord gave me six words. Salvation, justification, restoration, sanctification, and transformation. So the first word, salvation... The first time that word was mentioned in your Bible was when Moses was taking the children of Israel out of Egypt, and the children of Israel were standing before the Red Sea and the army behind them. And the Lord said to Moses to tell the people, stand still, stand firm, fear not, and see the salvation of the Lord. That word salvation is actually Yeshua. Isn't that awesome? And that word salvation is all-inclusive. It's deliverance. It's healing. It's restoration. It's bringing us to a place of atonement for our sins and to bring us into justification. Justification is what Yeshua did at Calvary for us sinners. Before we even knew him, while we were still sinners, he died for us. And his blood justifies us our sin, but we cannot treat that spirit of grace as if it were a common thing. We can't trample justification under our feet and say, I can live however I want. I can be in drugs. I can be in sexual sin. I can do whatever I want because I'm justified. That's what's being taught today. And that is God wants us to go from salvation and justification to restoration, Isaiah 61, he's come to bind up the broken heart and set the captives free. We're not the bride of Christ if we're not restored. If we're broken, we've got bitterness and resentment and rejection and abandonment and anger and rage and hatred and all that stuff going through us. Plus, we're sinning because we're trying to get comfortable in all this stuff. So God wants to restore our emotions. He's come to bind up the broken heart to set the captives free. Then he takes us to sanctification. Sanctification is setting us apart for holiness, for righteousness, to glorify his great name. To He's holy. It says to be holy as he's holy. So he sanctifies us. And through this process, he transforms us into his image. Pretty soon, we start acting and talking and believing. And we want to be like him. This is such a perfect time that we're in right now, the, the month of Elul. We're coming up tomorrow night to Rosh Hashanah. It's the new year, uh, the Jewish new year. And it starts the 10 days of awe, uh, of returning and cleansing and forgiving people and having them forgive you and getting healed and restored for the Day of Atonement. Coming up on the 30th, we'll be preaching on that on the 30th, and we'll be having a little thing tomorrow night. But what a perfect time to be in. 
but he wants to restore us. He wants to sanctify us. He wants to transform us. So it's salvation, justification, restoration, sanctification, transformation to bring glorification to his name. Because we're not glorifying him if we just stay in salvation. We're not glorifying him if we just stay in justification. He wants us to move on into restoration, sanctification, and transformation. And that's what soul care and inner healing and deliverance is all about. Let's give him a clap offering. I'm going to close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Oh, that you're washing us with water by your word. That you're presenting us to be glorious without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That, Father, you're coming back for your bride. Not a crippled bride, not a broken bride, not a dirty bride, but a glorious bride. And you're restoring our soul because you're the lover of our soul. You're cleansing those things out of us, Father. And then you're raising us up to be those laborers for the harvest field because the harvest field is ripe. All for your glory and all for your kingdom. In Yeshua's name, amen and amen. So your reading homework is chapters 5-7.